We are just a couple of days, John, for the grind to begin over at the Novacare Complex. Uh, but before we do, we'll dive into some stuff. You're writing about it at 97.3 ESPN.com. Uh, the Eagles Pro Football Focus says, all right, you got a decent defensive out line. You got good linebackers, but you got the worst secondary in the NFL. Is that accurate? You know, I, I don't think it is accurate. Uh, I don't think either is accurate. I, I don't think the Eagles have the top offensive line in football. I don't think they have the worst secondary in football. But it is a good indication that they're bad. one is a strength and <laughs> one is a weakness. Right. Yeah, it's so a good indication that they're not very unfair. good. Yeah. I don't think it's unfair to say – uh, it's pretty evident, particularly at cornerback. It's it's at least on paper uh, the weakest aspect of this team. I, I think what should be more alarming is that Pro Football Focus started to take it, represent the safeties as well, and conventional wisdom says they're pretty good. So maybe they're not as good as we thought they were, but. Uh, you know, I, I've seen Malcolm Jenkins play enough. I've seen Rodney McLeod play enough to to know that those safeties are better than the majority uh, of safety tandem, tandems in the NFL. I, I don't think that's unfair to say. Yeah, that's one area that I'd like to kind of expand on that, where the Eagles safeties are. The one problem is they don't have a lot of depth at that position. So if there is an injury at safety, uh, you know, they're still – they. it's been a couple of years. They really haven't figured out that uh, that situation. But Malcolm Jenkins and Rodney McLeod, they're both – maybe you would put them in the top half of the league. Yeah, unquestionably. I, I would say top ten. Right. I, as I said, I think it's unfair uh, to say that they haven't played well. Now – Pro Football Focus mentioned Rodney on occasion has trouble with missed tackles, and I think that's fair. Malcolm Jenkins has given up some big plays over the last two years. But, you know, part of the reason for that is he's had to play out of position so much uh, because out of necessity, the Eagles have had to play him in the slot a heck of a lot. I, I think, you know, the end game is you would like him to be a safety and only a safety, and I think his game would improve. Is that going to happen that this year? Case. Is that going to happen this year where they're going to slide him down into the nickel, or do you think that they finally will have someone to take that job from him? Or not take well, it from him, is, to not take it from him, not force him into it? Yeah, exactly. But that's always been the goal. The goal of the past two seasons – has been, and, and you notice through training camp, prior training camp, they rotated guys into that nickel slot, and the hope was that they would play well enough to where they didn't, wouldn't have to slide Malcolm down uh, into that spot on obvious passing downs. Unfortunately, it hasn't worked out because no one has stepped up, and all of a sudden week one arrives, and the Eagles are like, well, we better put Malcolm there because nobody else can do it. Right, and that's really and after Brooks got is, hurt last year. Yeah, and, and the assumption – yeah, you're right. So, uh, originally at the beginning of the season, Ron Brooks did it. The year before, though, uh, it was Malcolm from the get-go. Uh, and, you know, there's no question Jim Schwartz would like to have a traditional cornerback as the nickelback. Uh, and through the off season. Uh, what has been happening is that Jalen Mills has slided inside uh, when they're in nickel, and all of a sudden Rasul Douglas comes in off the bench opposite Patrick Robinson. That's how the majority of the offseason went. I think that's how they'll start off as training camp begins. But if any of those three pieces is not able to perform at the level they would like, all of a sudden – uh, Malcolm's going to be back in that conversation. But I think it's fair to say the Eagles don't want to put him in that position. They'll only do it if they have to. Yeah, th I mean, so it's not like they start out saying, hey, Malcolm, you're the nickel guy. It's, hey, these guys aren't very good. we got to ask you to go back down there. That seems to be the story. So it's Mills, Robinson, and Douglas. They're really the three guys that uh, get first crack at it, right? Yeah, uh, and, and towards the end of mini camp. You saw C.J. Smith mixing in a little bit on the outside with mm -hmm. the first team. You saw Aaron Grimes get a few first-team looks at the nickel, uh, but very few. So I, I think it's it's definitely going to be those three to start. Right. 
And then if they can't handle it, all of a sudden you'll see other guys mixing in, whether it's CJ, uh, whether it's Aaron Grimes, whether it's Ron Brooks, if he's healthy and he's back in the conversation. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. I, I think it is going to be uh, sort of uh, one of those positions that is closely monitored throughout training camp because a bunch of guys are going to have an opportunity to to earn some playing time, and that's understandable considering <laughs> – Pro football focus rated it yeah. 32nd out of 32. Hey, where's Jalen Watkins at this stage of his career? I mean, he was a guy that was pretty well known coming out of college. I mean, corner, safety, it's, he's listed as a safety, it seems like. Is that where they're focusing in on him at this point of his uh, tenure? What's he, third year now? Yeah, it, they made the switch last year, really. He's, he's just a safety now, uh, although in, in a pinch, he could certainly go back to corner. Uh, if you had a, an influx of injuries, a number of them, you could certainly – play that position uh and he was the thir- third safety for the majority of the season last year uh but i think he's getting pushed by terrence brooks i, I think brooks had a better off season uh and i think he'll start as the third safety i think they're both going to make the team though uh if, for depth purposes and i thought also think chris maragos is going to make the team but obviously more for a special team vacuum so when it's all said and done, I think the Eagles are going to keep 10 or 11 defensive backs. Uh, the problem is they're just not all that talented. But while I do say that, uh, the good news is, if there's good news, is the potential answers are on this team. And, and well, the big the answer, Jones the big answer, Douglas. John, you're right. The big answer won't play for potentially – half, if not the whole season, right? I mean, Sidney Jones, he's the answer that they're hoping really f- fixes a lot of these questions. Yeah, and, and that's that's what I said. That's the good news because, you know, the Eagles think they might have the next, you know, Lito, Shepard, Sheldon Brown combo uh, if everything hits right hmm. with Sidney Jones and Rasul Douglas. So all of a sudden, what looks like it, it, it just – uh, an atrocity on paper right now uh, as a bad group can all of a sudden in a year or two right. to be one of the strongest groups on this team if the ascension of those two particular players goes where the Eagles think it's going to go. Which is why a lot of people that were in the camp of, I like you drafting Sidney Jones, fall on that side because, all right, I don't know that you're good enough to win a Super Bowl this year, but I'm looking at uh, two, three years down the road where I'll take Sidney Jones and, and, and roll with him. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the Eagles would have taken Sidney Jones at 14 if he was completely healthy. Uh, and the and the choices were Sidney Jones or Derek Barnett. I think Sidney Jones would have been the 14th pick in the draft. Uh, that's how good he was. That's what his skill set was. He was a top 15 level talent in this draft. Right. Uh, so if it is just a hiccup, uh, and if he is 100% physically, whether it's uh, the second half of this season or next year, who cares mm-hmm. if you get that kind of talent playing a cornerback position that is obviously uh, devoid of talent right now. And, and you could say, uh, don't sleep on Rasul Douglas either, because I'm not. as far as his length... He's going to be very yeah, good. You're a West Virginia guy. <laughs> yeah. As far as his length and, and, and ball skills, they're top notch. So I think the only question regarding Rasul Douglas is he's not the fastest. Foot speed, guy in the right. World. Does he have so, the foot speed? Exactly. Right. And and but there are a lot of guys in this league who have figured it out and become good zone corners. Hey man, technique wins I, I think, a lot. Technique wins a lot in, in when you don't have it, when you have that uh, when you don't lack when you lack the speed, sometimes technique can make up for it. Yeah, and, and strength at the line of scrimmage. He's a big guy. He yeah. can beat up receivers at the line of scrimmage. So we'll, we'll have to say, as I said, you have to monitor it. And, and I'm not sure he's going to hit the ground running and play well immediately. But in, in, in a year or two, if it's Rasul Douglas and Sidney Jones on the outside and Jalen Mills settles in as a nickel corner, as I said, all of a yeah. sudden what looked really, really bad could look really, really right. good. If you're rolling out at the start of 18, uh, a look of Douglas, Sidney Jones, Malcolm Jenkins, Rodney McLeod, you're feeling a lot better about yourself. Maybe not, I mean, in 19, maybe, uh, what year are we in? 17. I'm talking about 18. 17. Right. If, so if next year there's your four, 
you feel pretty good. Although you start to wonder if they like the Flyers who have all these young defenders, but their forwards are starting to you know hit that you know the upper twenties. Like, are they going to be able to keep that group together to get a, a run out of them? Yeah, well, that's always the problem because just as you uh, assume that Jones and and Russell Douglas will be ramping up, probably yeah. Malcolm Jenkins will be ramping down, and Correct. that's. You know, sort of one of those things, and you're always balance, doing a balancing act in the NFL. That's part of it. And uh, at some point, the Eagles are going to have to address that and, and get a body in at the safety position as well because they don't have. It's interesting because they have good starters at safety but no prospects, and they have bad starters at cornerback but good prospects. Right. So. It is sort of that catch-22 right now. Hey, John McMullen's with us, 97.3 ESPN.com, at JF McMullen on Twitter. John, is two years really fair to judge someone's job performance? No. No, but it's also realistic in today's short attention span world where everyone has got their heads buried in their their phones and uh, everything is, is sort of a microwave culture. Uh, so... The answer is no, but the reality is you are. So if this is what I think it is, if this is could Doug Peterson be out after this season, yes, he could. Uh, is it fair? No, not not by any stretch of the imagination. And I, I don't think Doug's done himself any favors. No, those uh, comments by, don't help. No, and, and they were dumb comments. As I mentioned earlier this week on the show, they were dumb comments. I think Carson Wentz's comments were dumb comments, saying uh, we're going to our goal is the NFC East. Not to say, obviously, that's everyone's goal. I mean, you play this game to win your division and win the Super Bowl. So, on one hand, from a player standpoint, I, I don't hold it uh, against them all that much because I always ask media people, fellow media people, what did you expect the guy to say? If you're going to ask him, like, where do you want to be? Do you want to say, oh, oh golly shucks, I hope we win six games. I, I hope we finish in fourth place. I mean, you'd kill the guy uh, if he said that. So I kind of give them a pass. From a coach's standpoint, you got to be smarter about it. And you certainly don't want to bring up Brett Favre and Reggie White when you're saying your team has more talent than those Packers team. I, I mean, that's just silly. Uh, uh, so I do think he hurt himself. Uh, Tim McManus over at ESPN.com said another 7-9 and nine season won't do. Now, Tim's a pretty uh, level-headed guy. He doesn't just throw things out like that. So if the Eagles go 7-9, and nine, do you think uh, Doug Peterson's getting his walking papers? I think it's a possibility, and I'll tell you why. I, I think this, this organization is enamored with John Filippo. Uh, and, it, you know, I could see a scenario where they would say, rather than lose John, sort of elevate him past Frank Reich, past Doug Peterson, and make him the head coach after a bad season uh, if they were forced into it. I, now, while I say that, it, it's unlikely. Uh, I, I do think the Eagles will improve on 7-9. and nine, And even if they don't, uh, I think it's still – more likely than not, they will give Doug a third season. But if you start to dip in the five, six win category, that's when I think other things could get into play. Yeah, the five win category, you're taking steps back after spending money and bringing free agents in here. And we know uh, in the NFL, the schedule, things change from year to year. There's no question that the seven and nine team that you had last year may not be as good as your team this year and you could still be six and ten or five and eleven. Yeah, that's always a possibility. I always say you could be especially, you know, seven and nine, seven and nine, if you have a tougher schedule, you could be a much better football team. But obviously it's not going to be seen that way by those on the outside. So it it's you know, you have to show improvement. Uh if you think about where this team is you think about you expect improvement from a second-year quarterback and a second-year head coach. You've added so much talent on the offensive side of the ball. And I think the perception is Dallas is going to come back to the pack at least a little bit. 
I, I think people think the Giants overachieved, and I think people think the Redskins are a dumpster fire. Uh, so, <laughs> hey, uh, the and and not from a talent standpoint, but from an organizational standpoint. Uh, and when you when you look at that narrative, Doug Peterson almost has to improve on seven and nine. Uh, we'll see. It all starts on Monday. John McMullen, 97.3 ESPN.com. FanRag Sports NFL at JF McMullen on Twitter. Uh, you wrote about the uh, Dave Gettleman firing now and uh, about why Jerry Richardson might have done this. I think it's a really interesting story just about we talked about is two years enough. Here's a guy that was there for four years, a one year removed from going 15-1 and in the Super Bowl. So we say, is two years enough? Okay, he was there four, went 15-1, and one, went to a Super Bowl, went to the playoffs before that, right? They won the division the year before that. They didn't have a great year, but uh, ended up winning the division. So um, why is Dave Gettleman out of a job? And we're going to start seeing more and more teams with the quick trigger uh, making tur- change a turnover in the front office. Is it just too high pressure of a job for long-term stability? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's always uh... – dependent on the situation and i really do think it it depends on the circumstance uh, of a particular situation and carolina's from jerry richardson's perspective uh, as i mentioned in the piece he is the only nfl owner who used to Ah, it looks like we lost john just vanished off into thin air oh there he goes Uh, you were saying jerry richardson he's the only standpoint we lost you there for a second john you said jerry richardson is the only i think you were going to say only owner who actually played in the league yeah, he's the only owner who played in the league, uh, and I think he has more respect for his players, especially the players who mean so much to the franchise. And I'm talking about guys in the past that have feuded with Dave Gettleman, Steve Smith, D'Angelo Williams, and also that Gettleman has been having trouble getting extensions done with people like Thomas Davis and Greg Olson. Because they don't These like him? Is that are, is that the reason? No, I, I think it's because he's a traditional 2017 NFL general manager. He's very astute when it comes to business. Uh, And he realizes, look, if you pay for guys for what they've done in the past rather rather than what they're going to do in the future, you're probably going to be in for some trouble. And Gettleman's probably right. But Jerry Richardson wants to take care of Thomas Davis. Hmm. He does. That's just it. He doesn't want to be fighting with Steve Smith and D'Angelo Williams, who could be in that Hall of Fame, Carolina Hall of Fame, Carolina Ring of Honor, whatever you want to call it, they're really standard bearers of that organization. He did not like the relationships that were continuously developing. And I think that describes what went, went on in Carolina more than anything else. But Dave Gettleman as far as being a traditional general manager that 31 other owners yeah. would want, did a really good job. Uh, ESPN.com ranked the top 10 quarterbacks of the modern era going back to 1978. I want to give you the 10 real quick. I'll say the names. And uh, you say if I if they egregiously left anybody out or egregiously put anybody in, all right? Sure. We got 10 fouts. Nine, Breeze. Eight, Steve Young. Didn't want to confuse you with Vince Young. Uh, Tied for six, (laughs) (laughs) Brett Favre and Dan Marino. Five, Aaron Rodgers. Four, John Elway. Three, Montana. Two, Peyton Manning. One, Brady. Now, I know, I don't know if you read the article and thought anything about it or heard those 10 names and said, well, how was this guy there or this guy not there? I didn't read the article. It sounds like a pretty good list. I think you could always argue uh, on who should be where on any list. Uh, I I certainly think Brady and Montana should be at the top uh, because I think team success matters. And I think on any list, uh, forget modern. I think if you go back all time, those two guys are going to be in the top three. And then it's sort of pick your poison. I I think – I always say I I don't think anyone – when he's going at the top of his game, has ever played the position at a higher level than Aaron Rodgers. Uh, Peyton Manning, as far as orchestrating things from the line of scrimmage, 
I think he's the, the best at that. If you're looking at pure passers, I think you start talking about Marino, uh, just the ability to fling the football. And Favre, I mean, Favre was so unique. Uh, it, Green Bay has been so spoiled, if you think about what's gone on in that organization. Uh, the fact that they've had a quarter-plus century of Hall of Fame-level quarterback play virtually uninterrupted. I don't think it's ever happened before. I don't think it'll ever happen again. Uh, and the fact that they only have two Super Bowl titles, it, I, we say only in this town, you'd love to have two, but it's almost underachieving uh, from the standpoint of what they've had at that position. So I think over, it's all, overall, it's a pretty good list. The only question is, you know, where do you put guys? I would put Brady Montana 1-2, and you can argue who would be over the other. Yeah, the best of the rest. Eh? I was a little surprised. This is where the surprise starts to come in, uh, number 11. Now, I'm a big Roethlisberger fan. They had him at tied for 11th uh, of the last 30 years. Kurt Warner tied for 11th. Uh, Troy Aikman, number 13. Warren Moon, number 14. Jim Kelly at number 15. Eli Manning at number 16. So there you go. Well, I, I think, you know, one of the things, I, I think one guy doesn't belong. And I think if people who've listened to me long enough know who that name is. And it's not uh, Peyton Manning. <laughs> it's his baby brother. But, it, hey, people have. Says the guy who just said winning matters. <laughs> I, I know. And that's why. Yeah. And, and that's exactly why. So I know it's a bit of a contradiction. But what I just mentioned about the Carolina Panthers also applies. You have to look at situation. And if you look at Eli Manning, to me what defines greatness at the quarterback consist, uh, is consistency right. from week to week. And that's why I think his brother is top five all time. Because when you talk about the Indianapolis Colts, Denver Broncos, you could basically start at 11 wins and say, that's our floor. For any particular season. Uh, and if you were going to have a good season, you might get to 12, 13, 14. If you're going to have a bad season, it might be 10. Just the utmost consistency from week to week to week. His brother, on the other hand, was like Vinnie Johnson. He was like a streak shooter in the NBA. He got really hot on two particular years at the right time. He had great fronts on defense. And he's got two Super Bowl titles. Hey, that's great. You can't take him away from him. But when I talk about all-time great quarterbacks, and that's why Kurt, uh, Kurt Warner it wouldn't be there as well, by the way. For him, more from a longevity standpoint, I just don't think he did it for a long enough time. To me, it's more important the consistency from week to week more than anything yeah. else. Uh, John McMullen, of course, uh, every day at this time we talk football, we talk Eagles, and uh, starting Monday we will be at training camp at the Novacare Complex at J.F. McMullen. Uh, check out his national column at Fanrag Sports NFL. Thanks, John. Hey, thanks, Mike.